coaches. I'm delighted to have Ian Barker back, the Director of Coaching Education for the NCAA, to present today's topic, Effective Methodology for Coaching Technique and Game Tactics. Ian is somewhat unique, having held leadership positions with U.S. Youth Soccer and the NSCAA. Ian was the Director of Coaching and Player Development for Minnesota Youth Soccer Association for 10 years, and in 2012, he was hired in his current position with the NSCAA. Ian has also had 21 seasons with the men's programs at the University of Wisconsin and McAllister College. A national staff instructor for the NSCAA and U.S. Youth Soccer, and the head coach of the U.S. Youth Soccer's Region 2 Boys Olympic Development Program. Ian's qualifications are extensive, and he holds the USSFA license, the NSCAA Premier Diploma, and the NSCAA's Master Coach Diploma. And uh, welcome back, Ian, for the second time in the day. Thank you, David. Um, earlier on today, I was the warm-up act for Man United and Man City, and now I go head-to-head -head with... Um, uh, with the basketball, so this should be an interesting uh, afternoon for me. Let me just go back one slide here real quick. Good. Um, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I do enjoy doing these webinars, and I enjoy listening to them and following up on LinkedIn with the, with the questions and the discussions afterwards. So please feel free to type in questions while we're on the line for about half an hour, but certainly there's opportunities that David will explain to ask questions after the webinar, and I will respond to all of them. I enjoy doing that. Um, I would like to put, put to you today that we're going to talk about the craft of coaching, uh, which sounds a little pretentious, and uh, I'll make no significant apologies for that. Um, but my point of view is this. Uh, I watch a lot of uh, television. I watch a lot of law and order, but I don't think it qualifies me to be a lawyer, per se, any more than watching a lot of ER makes me qualified to be a doctor or a surgeon. And so whilst many, many people, including some of the parents that maybe criticize you at times as coaches, the high school club, college coaches, um, watch a lot of soccer, it doesn't necessarily mean they're an expert at the craft of coaching. Some element of being a coach is natural ability, is, I think is a little bit of innate ability. But I also believe that coaching is a learnable and trainable uh, product skill and something that you can always look to improve. And why would we seek to improve as coaches? And I think there's two reasons here, and I don't have them in any particular order. But one is, uh, the more competent you are as a coach, I think you'll find the greater your enjoyment and the satisfaction you derive from coaching. And as importantly, if not more so, your players will almost certainly develop at a stronger and more, uh, more impressive rate, and your players will appreciate and enjoy the fact that you're a competent and effective coach. The uh, presentation this evening is largely in two parts, um, and each part has five uh, subparts. One part I'd like to talk about is the way to structure different activity types to get to different learning outcomes, and the second part is actual delivery methodology. Um, in the first diagram here, you'll just see an example of an activity, five blues versus three oranges and a goalkeeper, so a 5v4. One goal, counterattack goals, what would you do with this type of structured activity? What coaching points would you bring out? The, the little uh, character they're juggling is more to do with how we would deliver. So we're trying to keep everything moving. Sometimes it's akin to herding cats, but we're always looking for intelligent ways to engage our athletes and improve their learning, but also yeah, make sure they're enjoying themselves. So there are five uh, common ways to structure activity. You can see those on the left there. Um, we want to employ these different use of uh, activities with an understanding of what we're trying to get at, get at uh, how we like to do it, which ties into what type of sessions we might offer, and what are our outcome, what are our learning outcomes from the training session that we do. And how you employ these different session types will certainly um, bear in mind your teaching capabilities as a coach and learning capabilities of your athletes and, and the level they're at and the way that they're able to absorb information. And then in terms of delivery styles, you can see the five that I'm going to talk about on the left there. I'd like to give a little shout out to Bob Jenkins, who was formerly the Director of Coaching for the Federation 
and also former U18 national team coach on the men's side. And he came up with the notion of a toolbox. So the five tools on the left pop into the toolbox, and then we as coaches intelligently pull them out when we want to use them. Truth is, we probably employ all of these techniques at some point, but very often we do it unconsciously. And I think to become a, a good, effective coach, to pursue the crafts of coaching, it's employing these delivery techniques consciously. And that's something that I think is, is, is critical. Just before we go into our two lists of types of activity and types of delivery, how do we uh, look at training overall? And this development cycle is something that's very commonly found in NSCA and Federation programming. And I think it, I think it really helps us. So the idea here is that you have a performance. You have to have a game or some opportunity to watch your players. Then you evaluate your players. You evaluate the strengths and weaknesses. And on the basis of that evaluation, you determine the training protocols, how you're going to structure training, and how you're going to deliver your information. And then, of course, you go back to performance. And so there's this cycle. Um, the evaluation component, I think, is very critical prior to the training. And it needs to be managed. So if you're a very animated, amped up coach, you may not be able to critically evaluate the activity, the action of the game. Uh, as I was saying earlier, I watched MLS coaches this weekend. And their long-term vision of the game doesn't have to be so tight, because they have the ability to use ProZone and video and so on and so forth. But many times, if you're a youth coach, high school coach, college coach, um, semi-pro coach, you have to get all of your evaluative opportunity taken during the game. And so not only are you coaching the game, but you're having to watch the game to determine your next training and performance uh, goals. So this is the first of our training opportunities, probably the most common. You'll see the little, little fellas here on the left, or the right, excuse me, building up the training session. Notions here are simple to complex. And I believe that when we do this type of warm-up, small-sided activity, expanded small side activity, and then finally with the game. It also mirrors physical expectations of athletes. That's to say they want to get warmed up, they expect bursts of activity, they expect the game, and then they want to cool down. And I think to some extent it fits the psychological and cognitive needs of the players. It will put a tremendous amount of focus in up to a point, and then they need to kind of wind it down. So a progressive training methodology, and these are very commonly found um, and expected in our formal coaching schools. So if you've taken federation courses, SEA courses, you'll be familiar with preparing a whole lesson plan that develops primarily from simple to complex. Moving on to the second activity type structure is this notion of phase of play, which might be halfway line to the goal, top of the center circle to the goal, uh, so on and so forth. This is really effective for tactical training. Because one of the ideas here is you get a tremendous opportunity to recreate situations uh, with great frequency. So much as you would train technique with a high degree of frequency, in a phase of play, you can manage a lot of tactical repetition. Ideally, in this environment, you coach one of the teams. But because there are goals and objectives for the other team, the team you're coaching will typically have some challenges and problems to solve what the other team just plays somewhat uncoached by you. So you try to coach one team in this opportunity. Um, and you'll appreciate that certainly you could use this as the middle part of a progressive training session. So these types of uh, activities, this way of structuring activity, is not mutually exclusive. Some of them you can combine. But phase of play, a uh, very, uh, very um, enjoyable and, and popular way, especially in a, a, a strong tactical setting. Moving along here to whole part whole, I'm quite proud of myself as finding a whole cupcake, a half cupcake, and then another whole cupcake. The idea here is this mirrors your cycle of development. That's to say, in this type of training, you have the, the performance, you have the opportunity to evaluate the performance, you plan the training, and then you come back to the performance. And I'm sure most of us already do this on, an, on a weekly basis. So we have a game on Saturday, we look at it, we train. Tuesday, Thursday, we have the following game uh, on, the, on the following Saturday. But in this opportunity, what we're talking about is doing this all in 75 minutes. So it's a great way to start training with a little scrimmage, 66, 77, um, and the players certainly like it. However, the challenge for you as the coach is quite great, because as you're watching the short scrimmage, you must identify some things to address, and then quickly come into a training environment 
and then finish the training session with a game. So you've got to work on the fly and you've got to also set up the activity to get the new logistics all taken care of. So this is a very effective training methodology that can be quite a challenge for a novice coach, but it's certainly something to sort of add to your arsenal of ways of doing training. <clears throat> so shower pattern play, these are prescribed movements and sequences, um, and hopefully when you're giving the, the players prescribed movement and sequences, there are options in there and, and spin-offs. So you certainly would do this in set play situations where you might have a little choreography. We're talking here about a choreographed movement that will appear in the flow of play. It could be as simple as a two versus nobody, where you're showing players the basic shape of what an overlap looks like. So walking players through an overlap is, is a shadow or pattern play. Um, it could certainly be done as a function. So maybe you take your back four and you show movement of your back four. It could be an attacking pattern the front five players and some of the movement patterns and where they would run if the winger comes in from one side and you overlap what happens. Um, and certainly flank functions. So you take your right-sided centre back, uh, right back, right winger, and you work on patterns and things out of there. I think it's quite good if you can do this with layering in some opposition. So maybe it starts off 6 v nobody, 6 v 2, 6 v 4. So now the patterns have to happen based on realistic game situations. But the defenders mess up uh, the, the strict choreography. Um, one way I like to use this particular activity is to have two teams, 560 nobody, working north to south one and the other one working south to north, and they kind of do their patterns through each other. They don't actually oppose each other, but it just gets a sense of confusion, uh, but it also allows us to establish some, some patterns and rhythm. And then finally, coaching in the game, Jose Mourinho there with Real Madrid. Um, this is not game coaching. This isn't standing on the sideline barking instructions. This is getting into the training game um, and allowing yourself a unique perspective of what the players see. So you stand with your goalkeeper, you stand with your centre back, you stand with one of your wingers to see how little engagement he or she gets, or how how often they are played into the brought into the play. So it offers you a unique perspective, um, and it allows for highly localized attention and direction on your part. And it can also give you a really interesting perspective of dynamics on your team. Who's talking? What are they saying? What is the body language? It just gives you a very unique opportunity. So we're big advocates in the NSCAA of getting in there sometimes and being in the middle of the training. And so those are our five ways of, of uh, employing different uh, activities and, and different perspectives for you as the coach. And now we'll go to the five delivery methods. So I'll spin through these quite quickly and so I can turn it back to David here in an appropriate time. The notion of coaching in the flow is, is certainly something that everybody can do. We can all stand on the sideline and articulate what's going on and maybe articulate some instruction. Um, but not everybody can do it very well. And so for, a net, for an experienced coach, this is natural. You can watch the game. You know when to modulate your voice. You know what information to put in. You know whether it's being attended to. And it isn't white noise. And it isn't commentating. It's definitely instructional. Um, it isn't necessarily the easiest delivery method for coaching. And it's certainly not a cop-out to stand quietly on the sideline and occasionally interject into the training session. I will caution you that sometimes parents and ADs might look at you and say, well, he or she's not coaching very much which is, is actually kind of a nonsense because you could be very, very effectively coaching and being quite unobtrusive to the player's overall flow. So we quite like coaching in the flow. And the intention of this, the intention of this is to maximize effectiveness and not to just spew your knowledge out. So you're not meant to stand there and give the players all the answers of the game. You're meant to coach what you see and hopefully um, it has relevance to the players. Coaching at natural stoppages, a cow walking across the field might be considered a natural stoppage. And the timing here is key. So it's an opportunity when there's a small lull in play, referee blows the whistle, ball goes out of bounds, for you to, to step in, interject, and maybe you can get a little bit of the player's attention because there's just this momentary pause. Um, this is where the great value of small-sided games comes in because not only are there lots of repetitions of technique and tactics, but also the ball's flying in and out. So you can have very uh, ample opportunity and frequent opportunity 
to coach at a natural stoppage. It doesn't necessarily mean that the players have stopped. They can still be recovering to positions, taking up positions, but you can be getting some insight in during this uh, natural stoppage where the ball is out of play. Um, and one of the values of this type of methodology is that your, uh, your disruption to the flow of activity is minimal, minimal if, if at all, because whilst the ball's being retrieved, you get the point in and you step back out again. So I, I'm quite, uh, quite keen on natural stoppage. Coaching the individual, uh, obviously Mancini and Balotelli there in that picture. And this can occur in many theatres. That's to say, um, when there's a break in the action, a natural stoppage, Maybe the player is a sub, you pull them to one side, have a quick chat with them on the bench about something you've seen or about their opportunity when they go in. And certainly you can coach the individual in the flow. So he or she can be running up and down, and if you can get intelligent information in, it doesn't distract them, but they can take it on board, that would be a way. Or you can absolutely pull them to the sideline in the training environment or in the game and give them a little bit of insight and let them go back again. Some strengths to this delivery method is it's very specific, it's very personal, so the player knows that you're attending to them as an individual and you're giving them direct information that will improve their, their ability or their competence. Um, and it's also information that not the whole group needs, so why spend time stopping 20 players or 17 players when one player just needs this piece of information? It's very powerful for knowledge retention. Your players will certainly remember if they get an individual interaction with you where well, you give them constructive coaching information. So we're very, very keen on coaching the individual. Coaching through the activity, um, an activity here I'll just address briefly. But we're not talking about 101 great drills. We're rather talking about a battery of activities that you use that help the players get to some of the solutions, help you coach by the problems the activity solves. Uh, so for example, you can use a number of different goals in the training environment. You can use a big goal. You can use small goals. You can use multiple goals, as in this diagram. You could use target players. You could use zones. It's, it doesn't have to be two fixed, eight, eight by 24 goals. Um, in this example here, uh, the white team is demonstrating how they shift from the right flank to the left, where the ball is being played to, as they protect the, the three goals at the bottom of the screen. So what we're working on in this activity is switching the point of attack if we're the blacks to try to find the open goal and the white team trying to shift in unison. Uh, so we're working on back four shift, but we're using three goals to help us with that. So just an example of how we might use a particular activity. Um, and the activity itself brings out your coaching observation. And then finally, the much maligned freeze methodology or stop, correct, rehearse, restart. And it's much maligned with good reason. That's to say, when it's done poorly, it really is very, very intrusive and really turns the kids off because they're all standing around looking at their shoe while uh, the coach waffles on about something and it's not relevant, it's not engaging, and it goes on for long, uh, too long. Um, but it's still very, very popular, and I think it can be very, very effective if it's done very well. That's to say, you try to capture the moment, get the kids to pause, get in, Show your, uh, show your correction, show your coaching point, and then critically, um, get the restart correct. And so once you've gone in and you've kind of stopped the action, then I like to use the words live off of, and in my case, my first touch, or live after Bill touches it, or live after Lucy touches it. So as the coach, you manufacture the restart to give the players the opportunity to see the correction you made almost immediately. So the restart is critical here. And, and equally critical is this uh, repeated notion of clarity, brevity, and relevance. And it has to be relevant to all of them. Otherwise, why stop the training? Uh, just pull one kid out and help him or help, help her. So those are my five ways of structuring activity and being involved in activity and my five ways of delivering a message or communicating. Just a couple more um, ideas about how to become a more effective coach. I, I, I'm not quite sure what the cloud means, what sits in the cloud, but I, I get the sense there's a tremendous amount of great coaching education in, in this country and certainly in the sport of soccer. And we have, we're very blessed in this country with having a lot of people who are very enthusiastic about educating themselves more about something they enjoy doing. I would define the educational opportunities in three ways, formal, 
the National Coaching Schools, Federation Badges, and SCA Badges. Uh, Semi-formal clinics, symposia, where you go and you're pr primarily you're watching as opposed to being evaluated or tested or putting on sessions yourself. And certainly the NSCA convention, amongst others, is an example of semi-formal. And then the informal would be every opportunity you take to read a book, a webinar, chat with a friend at training, uh, chat with your club director of coaching, where you're picking up education. And I think, obviously, informal education is what we should be doing all the time and, and making ourselves available for semi-formal. Sure, there's opportunities to go out and watch other coaches. And then obviously the formal on an annual, every couple of years you take a badge, you get yourself into that environment. Confidence, self-confidence, and I think it's important to know what you're good at, but equally what your, your weaknesses are. And making a conscious decision, do you try to support your weaknesses, or do you kind of let your weaknesses sit to one side and you focus on your strengths? So being self-aware, practice, practice makes permanent. So if you've been given bad information and you go out and you coach bad information, you'll be really good at doing it poorly. So practice makes permanent. Uh, try to equip yourself with good ideas and, and go from there. And then feedback and evaluation. So give yourself critical feedback. Try to get external feedback, uh, a co-coach, um, your club director of coaching. And the power of video becomes very, very important in here, obviously, if you can videotape yourself. And I didn't put it on the slide, but observation. Um, anytime you can go and watch other coaches work, you'll pick something up, whether they be more uh, uh, higher, more experienced than you uh, within your club, college coaches, or they might even be junior coaches and um, less experienced than you. But I guarantee if you go out and observe them, you'll pick up ideas. You might pick up ideas of what not to do, and hopefully you'll pick up some ideas about what you could employ intelligently in your training. And then my last little plug here in terms of ongoing education and the notion of the craft. So the formal, these are the, the formal opportunities the NSCA has. The Federation has excellent uh, coaching awards, and I've been lucky enough to go through all those. Um, we're also blessed in this country with uh, clinics and symposia and a tremendous amount of resource products that you can find online, books, tapes, videos, webinars, for, for sure. And I'll make one little plug here as my sign-off point. UEFA.com, which is the European Federation, UEFA.com, um, has some wonderful uh, coach education resources on its page. And it's probably, of the seven uh, global confederations for soccer, it's probably the, the strongest in coach education. So if you want some additional resource material, including videos, um, UEFA.com is a great resource. And with that said, it's been a pleasure to be